Hey friends, uh, Stefan and I are here uh, to talk about Flux becoming an incubating project and to give you a little bit of a view of the road ahead. Super excited here to be joining Stefan. Hello everyone, I'm Stefan Prodan. I'm a developer experience engineer at WeWorks and I'm um, a long time uh, flagger and Flux maintainer. I'm very happy to be here and speak about the future of Flux and where, where we are going with it. Yeah, me as well. Uh, Lee Kapili, also on the developer experience team at Weave. Uh, Stefan and I have been in the cloud native space for a while. Uh, if you contribute in the Kubernetes community, you may have noticed me over there. I used to work on Kubedam quite a bit. And uh, now we're doing cluster add-ons and interested in uh, some other kinds of deployment artifacts for Flux. Um, also really interested in security and multi-tenancy. Uh, I maintain a project called Ignite, uh, which does micro VMs in a Docker-like way. So uh, both Stefan and I really like helping people, which is why Flux is a great project for us. Um, Flux is super awesome. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about why uh, we think so. It's one of the most mature technologies right now that's developing in the cloud native space. Uh, here you can see Flux along with a bunch of other amazing projects. And uh, Flux alongside Helm, as um, reported by the CNCF technology radar last year, uh, mid-June, they were saying, hey, these are some things that you should really be looking at adopting uh, into your production workflows. And many users have uh, chosen to be on that journey with us uh, in the project. The Flux community has done so much to really learn and pioneer what it means to do GitOps. You can see we have a diverse uh, set of users and users who operate Flux uh, and do GitOps at different scales uh, in different um, kind of formats and varieties. And uh, so GitOps we find is working for people, whether they are managing their own services or offering Flux as part of their product. Um, and as the Flux project has developed, we've come to start to formalize a little bit about what a good opinion for doing GitOps uh, can be. Uh, there's a couple of principles that we like to help people get on the road to guiding towards good social and technical solutions with Git and declarative systems. Uh, so if you can describe your system declaratively, this is a good prerequisite that you need to be able to meet. Um, if you're working with systems that have imperative APIs, uh, thinking about how to do those things declaratively can help you on the road to GitOps. Then you put those declarations as configuration stored in source. Right? So when you have source control systems like Git or Subversion, uh, or even things like Google Sheets, which can be a versioned and declarative store for information, um, then you are getting to that second tenant. And then using software agents that can then take those machine readable configurations and reconcile them towards your infrastructure, or your process, or your policies, or whatever you are trying to manage with GitOps to either ensure correctness or alert for a drift when it occurs uh, is kind of that third point. You, you really do need some sort of constant reconciliation here. Uh, it's what we found with a good recommendation, uh, not just something that's only eventing, although events can be a powerful parts of the GitOps platform and help you integrate with other systems like CI. And so when you follow these principles, you get some pretty clear benefits. Uh, one is this first point that maybe seems obvious, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Why, why do we get collaboration on infrastructure? We know that devs know Git, right? Some would even say that they love Git, other people may not, right? But devs all have adopted Git. And this means that you likely have a solution uh, for managing Git already in your organization. So regardless of the complexity of your team, you have some of that organizational complexity coded into how you store and version your code. So if you do that with your declarative config as well, you get the benefits of that existing platform, which means that you get access control 
you have an auditable history. And on that historically controlled declaration of how you want things to be configured, you get drift correction and these clear boundaries of access between the actual infrastructure and where your dev teams collaborate. And so there's a security boundary here and you get the benefits of how your organization already works. Um, and all of these concerns are actually things that Kubernetes is not really scoped to take full responsibility of, right? There's no version control that's meant to be accessed by humans inside of the Kubernetes API. And in the same way, collaboration on comments and missing fields and things like that, why things were done, what order they were done, who was involved in making decisions, that's not Kubernetes responsibility. But it can be the responsibility of your Git platform, and that's how we get GitOps. And so why is Flux a good tool set? And what's the scope of the project? We talk about GitOps well. We talk about Flux helping you provide complete continuous delivery capabilities on top of Kubernetes specifically, and then supporting Kubernetes best practices by tying in the best in class cloud native tools that are emerging, things like customize, Helm, uh, metrics with Prometheus and so on. And we've broken up that architecture to be Kubernetes uh, native and to be very extensible, uh, open community friendly. And I mentioned uh, that we have such a large Flux user base already. And that points to really a multi-year journey uh, as we've come to learn and make GitOps more mature. We've also learned that we need to make the software more mature. And so for the past, the better part of a year now, uh, the maintenance team that has been involved with Flux has grown and we're working on Flux too. So the main kind of difference uh, that we want to point out is that Flux One was really built as a targeted but monolithic piece of software that was responsible for syncing a single Git repository and also applying it to a local cluster. And then there was this image automation feature that people grew to really use and love. So in Flux Two, what we've done is we've really identified how to compose the different pieces of GitOps in a more accurate way. So if you need to implement GitOps to meet your particular organization's needs, we've split up the APIs so that you can do exactly what you want. And we've accomplished the reconciliation of those GitOps configurations or GitOps related configurations, I should say, how you actually assemble your platform with Kubernetes native APIs and microservices rewritten from scratch so that it's possible now to sync multiple Git repositories, uh, apply them at different times. You can get this really rich feature set. You can apply them to local clusters or remote clusters and much more. And so the project structure has changed. And if you're interested in getting involved and contributing uh, or even just keeping a heartbeat on what issues and bugs and releases look like, then we now have multiple project repos that comprise of the several controllers that now make up the flux to effort to move the project forward. Uh, also, Stefan happens to be uh, really the original maintainer and creator of Flagger, and we're happy to uh, just note that Flagger is also now part of the Flux CD org, so we have that repo. Um, I want to talk about what makes Flux 2 so awesome. Right. So Flux 1, really great first step. And if you're using Flux One, uh, I, I just want to help you understand uh, what is getting better and what you're getting out of Flux Two. Uh, things that have traditionally been challenging, we've really thought about them, uh, and the project is moving in a super exciting direction. Uh, Flux gives you flexible tools to implement GitOps for your team's specific needs. Right? So if you want to do declarative Helm, then you can take those imperative like local laptop workflows where you're iterating on a cluster and modifying it, you can move that into some place where it's possible to collaborate with GitOps. Flux lets you do declarative Helm. If you want to represent each piece of your infrastructure's configuration as separate bits, separate packages, components, or folders, you can then configure health checks. You can create dependent ordering between those components through the use of a a DAG, a directed cyclical graph, 
you can create a, a dependency tree if you would like. And that creates a super awesome bootstrap story that we've also done extra work to help with external platform creation like GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket, et cetera. So when you put all of these pieces together, it's you get a story where you can create a brand new cluster, point it to a declarative repository, run a flip bootstrap, and you never have to modify it manually with any kind of imperative workflow, something that needs to be deployed in a specific order. And this is an amazing feature set and something that uh, brings organizations a lot of success and peace with regard to disaster recovery, scaling out new deployments for new customers or whatever it may be. Uh, these are some of the immediate benefits that you get from doing GitOps in a declarative way. And Flux can now do dependencies uh, as part of that. Flux can do very sophisticated actuations of continuous delivery. So if you want to say have your Git artifacts or your Helm artifacts, your config, be tagged or versioned in a specific way, you can ask Flux to make sure to stay up to date with that tagging policy. If you want your Git repo to only release config when you make a tag that is a Semver patch bump, you can tell Flux to do that. The same thing is true if you are holding Helm, um, Helm charts inside of a Helm repository. And we also support storing your Helm charts directly in Git with some caveats. And so lots of very powerful feature sets there for um, automating the mechanisms that are needed to do continuous delivery so that you have to do less stuff when you're actually just trying to release software. Along with that, we've got some forming APIs and controller mechanisms for doing image tag updates that compose really well with these tagging strategies. And so lots of mechanisms available for you in Flux to do awesome GitOps the way that you need to. Something that I'm particularly excited about is our ability to compose multiple repositories, folders, branches, refs, everything, whatever you could imagine. Like, oh, I want to store my configuration in that place or this way or in a bucket. It's possible to do with Flux. And this also gives us really nice synergy with our multi-tenant fee story. So each one of these pieces that you would want to reconcile to a cluster for a particular tagging policy or whatever you need, you can also then restrict it via RBAC with our support for service accounts, which also leads into our support for kube configs. It's possible to, for any of the artifacts that you're synchronizing to your cluster using Flux APIs, also mention that you want it to be synced to a remote cluster, which gives you the ability to do central management fleets or, or central cluster, multi-cluster management from a specific management cluster um, or all kinds of fun things. Uh, so you could even use this in a, uh, B2B relationship where you're offering a service, right? You could use a management cluster to uh, remotely apply um, stuff from your GitOps control repo into a customer's cluster, et cetera. Lastly, because we built everything with cloud native tools in mind and in a Kubernetes native way, Flux is way more observable than ever. And so previously in Flux One, we would frequently have issues where folks were struggling to read the log messages or understand why syncs were not occurring. Um, and because things have now been broken out into their individual pieces and they're represented declaratively in your Git repository, subsequently in the Kubernetes API, you can tell if something is failing to fetch on the Git repository object. You can tell if a validation is occurring, a validation issue is occurring with your configuration on the customization object. If Helm is failing to upgrade a particular thing, you can check the Helm release object. And so all of that status is exposed in case status compliant custom resources and with events and Prometheus metrics that you can instrument on. You'll see later in Stefan's slide that we have an awesome dashboard for this. Additionally, our notification controller is super generic and very powerful just across the board. Flux is built in a way it's factored so that the individual pieces, you can control them and you can also extend them, uh, which is an expectation that I think we should hold a high bar for in the cloud native ecosystem. 
that Flux gladly needs. Probably the most important feature I think of Flux is the strength of the community. Uh, I've tried so hard uh, to emphasize and highlight that where we are with GitOps today is because the practitioners in the field have taken a bet on the Flux project, taken a bet on the ideology of GitOps and moved it forward. We've seen uh, more of this maturity occurring as we've come to constrain and expand GitOps, the definition of what it is in to, to really make it more mature with things like GitOps days. Uh, if you even just look at the statistics with the project, we're at 40,000 contributions and counting, 26,000 of those have been since Sandbox. And so just from Sandbox to today, which is incubation, um, lots of activity. Uh, 1,888 contributors is a pretty insane stat. I shouldn't say insane, but it's incredible. Uh, 16,000 plus commits. We have 14 maintainers now from five different companies. Uh, and there were six maintainers and three companies at Sandbox time. So really points to sustainable growth in the leadership and maintenance of the project. We are building something that is sustainable and a true community effort here. 12,000 plus GitHub stars, uh, definitely lots of growth there. And it's just clear when you get involved with the community that we're building something super healthy, uh, people helping each other and lots of love as well as an excellent code of conduct. So if you're looking to get started with Flux, say you're new here and you're just learning about it, um, our website has a great path for you. Uh, so go ahead and check out our getting started guides. Uh, also, we've done our best to really transparently show throughout the Flux2 development progress uh, or process what these new features look like, how they're supposed to be used. We've, uh, we have a call every other Monday that you can join. Um, check out the meetup page and the recordings there get posted to a YouTube playlist uh, where you can see very often me, but also other Flux community members um, either fail through a demo or do something really fun and cool. Also, uh, just a uh, call out to Victor Farsik, uh, who did a great dive into and demo of how Flux2 is working. Go ahead and check out the YouTube videos if you learn well in that format. Now, this would be incomplete if we didn't also talk about Flux1 users and their road to maturing with Flux as we move to V2. And so we've got an excellent migration story that we're continuing to improve. Already tons of docs that have every caveat that you can think of, every consideration or change uh, in behavior that we would like to encourage as you move to Flux V2. Uh, go ahead and check out the specific migration section in the sidebar of our documentation site. Uh, again, you can get there by just going to Flux CDIO um, or at these links below. So um, Flux2 community, I, I can't stress this enough. I mean, I'm so excited about what we're doing with Flux to produce flexible tooling that lets you do things the way that you need to, um, to accomplish uh, or to build the proper GitOps approach for your org, uh, which includes thinking about not just technical solutions, but also the social ones. And um, Flux2 is going in a really good direction. So that's why we have Steph on here today, is to really give you some context and a deep dive into how Flux really works. Stefan, take it away. Thank you, Lee. I'm going to try something different today. I'm going to talk about Flux and Flux features uh, from a user perspective. So we've um, We've split up the Flux personas into three categories. We have cluster operators, the nice people that are creating clusters for us. They are maintaining them. They are doing provisioning, upgrades, and so on. Uh, we have platform engineers, those that build continuous delivery pipelines. They help the developer uh, teams get more velocity. And they also do engineering work. They uh, can extend Flux in, uh, in ways that we haven't figured out yet, 
or they can uh, trim it down and use only those components that they, uh, they need in their workflows. And finally, app developers, of course, they rely on continuous delivery to get their code uh, on production systems. But it's not only about production system, it's the journey of, you know, you commit something to your source code, how it goes through different stages, CI, CD, environments, promotions, um, you know, feedback of what's going on you, with your app before it reaches its final uh, state in a, in a production cluster. So I'll, I'll try to, to explain Flux from, from these three uh, perspectives. Let's start with cluster operators. So what, what the cluster operator has, has to do, it has to develop um, work on a cluster definition first, right? It can be, let's say, a Nike scuttle config where you set up your IAM roles, your VPCs, your uh, node groups, and so on. It can be um, a Terraform project where you use some um, uh, cloud provider or you target your on-prem clusters or even bare metal uh, systems. So that's, that's step one. You figure out how, how to define your cluster and how to create that cluster inside your infrastructure. Um, step two is what you want to provide with, within that cluster the cluster add-ons, what CNI you are going to use, what ingress controller are you going to use a service mesh uh, and so on. So there is a lot of, you know, different, there are so many differences between um, how clusters get composed. You, you'll, it's hard to find two clusters alike. Like everybody, there are so many add-ons out there. If you look at the Kubernetes cluster, is always something new, maybe run some add-on that you never heard about because there are so many add-ons out there, right? And, and third, uh, as a cluster operator, you want to onboard tenants. Now, what is a tenant? A tenant can be a dev team or a tenant can be um, a whole organization if you provide this as a service to others and so on. Uh, the idea of a tenant is when that you have to you know, isolate and put some boundaries around what a tenant can do to your infrastructure. Can a tenant delete nodes? Can a tenant, you know, wipe out your ingress controllers and so on? Maybe not. So you have to set some boundaries for, for these uh, tenants. And lastly, you have to maintain these clusters. You have to upgrade them, CVs, um, Kubernetes on a fast track, even now is not that fast, but it used to be very fast. So you have to keep up with, with uh, the latest version and not only of the cluster, but also of the add-ons and so on. So how do you bring structure into this and how you, you make it traceable every change? Um, one way to do it is you store everything in a single repo and you call that your infrastructure uh, or fleet management repo where you can put together all these uh, definitions, um, be it Terraform, be it some config, uh, that's one consideration. But once you have the, uh, the cluster up and running, all the add-ons and all the tenants, they can be, they can subscribe to the same um, GitOps principle as uh, delivering apps. The main difference between uh, delivering apps and delivering uh, cluster add-ons is the fact that you don't control the CI system, you don't control the uh, build system of, of the cluster add-on. You are a consumer of it. You are also, in most times, a consumer of the uh, configuration of the add-on. You may be using some Helm chart to install, let's say, an ingress controller. You will not be developing that from scratch. You want to reuse what's already there and may amend, make some uh, small changes to it. So you'll be changing things in your uh, infrastructure Git repo, then there is some continuous delivery system that applies those changes to your uh, fleet of clusters, right? That's... Um, the GitOps principle. I'm calling these different clusters environments. You can have a dev environment, staging environment, and so on. So you'll have, um, we call them overlays, like in customized overlays, where you take an add-on and you 
uh, do small modifications over it, depending on which environment it needs to uh, end up on um, and so on. For example, maybe you want to have a database with uh, ephemeral storage for your for your dev cluster, but on your production cluster, you want to change the, the how, how the storage is managed and switch to, a, I don't know, PVC uh, stable sets and so on. So there are, there are challenges in making these overlays and fit them into your into your environments. Now, uh, Flux uh, version two comes with uh, tooling. So it, to help you bootstrap clusters and uh, have a um, consistent way of creating new clusters, modifying them, upgrading them, and so on. So in terms of bootstrapping, we offer two things. One is the Flux CLI. And the Flux CLI offers a bootstrap command that works with uh, GitHub and GitLab for now. We are also looking at extending it to Bitbucket and we are working uh, as we speak on an SSH agent implementation. The idea is you tell Flux, hey, I want to um, create a repository on my Git provider where I will like to store all the infrastructure items for not only one cluster, for my whole fleet of clusters. So you run this Flux bootstrap command, you give it your organization name, your repository name, uh, and you, you tell Flux which um, cluster to target, right? Uh, Flux will use the um, kubectl kubeconfig so whatever you have there in your uh, the default kubeconfig, um, the Flux Bootstrap will address that. Now, maybe our uh, Git provider implementations are not enough for you. So that's why we also um, reused uh, much of the Flux Bootstrap code and created a, a, Terra, a Flux Terraform provider. So you can um, use our Terraform provider and target your own uh, Git hosts, your own clusters, and so on. So there are here are two ways of, um, you know, setting up Flux on your cluster, configure deploy keys so that Flux has access to your your repo. You can also specify things access uh, to that particular repo, and Flux Bootstrap is also the way to upgrade Flux on clusters. It's item potent. You can run it. Um, no matter how many times you want, if something is new, if you specify a new version or uh, you are using the embedded version in the Flux CLI and it will detect, oh, I need now to upgrade and what it will do, it will commit that to your Git repo and Flux will update itself. So Flux uh, version two, it's managing itself um, through Git. Let's see how this looks. So, have the fleet repo, there you store all your uh, definitions and an overlay for, for each cluster. Then um, all these flux controllers are running on each cluster and they will pull changes on, from the fleet repo. Any change to an infrastructure item or let's say you add a tenant or you uh, change the, um, you know, the access policy of a, a particular uh, app, you change some RBAC and so on. Uh, Flux will detect that change and will apply it on one cluster or on many clusters, depending on how you uh, you want to do this master uh, multi-cluster management. In terms of cluster management, version two comes with many features. Um, one important feature that we we've built uh, into version two is dependency management for infrastructure and apps, and I will. I will give you an example of what that means. Let's say you have, um, you want to install um, a controller that comes with its own custom resource definition. Let's say you want to provision uh, certificates from Let's Encrypt uh, dynamically for your apps. Um, the best way to do that is uh, by using Cert Manager, which is a CNCF project. And the issue here is, Inside the same repo, you'll have the cert manager definitions. Um, maybe you refer to the upstream uh, uh, Helm uh, chart for cert manager, and you want to install cert manager from that chart. Maybe you want to get the cert manager custom resource definitions from their uh, GitHub repository release page. 
uh, Flux allows you to combine things like plain YAMLs that come from URLs with other YAMLs that come from Git repos and other configurations that come from Helm repositories. So you can button them together and create an, um, a definition that um, reconciles Cert Manager on your cluster and uh, keeps it up to date. Now, let's say you want to create now uh, certificates using uh, the Cert Manager um, custom resources. If you apply the uh, certificate definition along with uh, Cert Manager deployment at the same time uh, in Flux version tool, they will fail. And why they will fail? Because we've uh, enabled by default um, Kubernetes API server side validation. Why we, we did that? Because we want to make sure that every commit that you do, every change of your infrastructure uh, is applied as a transaction on your Kubernetes cluster. So if you change, let's say, 10 manifests, one change is not acceptable. Maybe you have something that, I don't know, something like a gatekeeper will reject, or maybe even the Kubernetes API will reject. There is a typo there. Instead of, I don't know, type load balancer, you mistype load balancer, stuff like that. The Kubernetes API will reject it. So how can we compose our uh, infrastructure items in a way that works with Kubernetes and also it enforces validation. We have this uh, depends on um, field inside our custom resources. So you can say, I want to have set manager installed. Then I will also declare here a health check, which looks at set manager deployment. And I'm saying, hey, I want to install set manager. It's custom resource definitions. I want to make sure set manager is up and running and only then apply um, the certificates uh, manifests. And this applies to many things, uh, not only Cert Manager. Um, maybe you want to enforce policies right at the cluster bootstrap. So maybe you want to say, I want Kiverno or uh, OPA Gatekeeper to be the first thing that gets deployed on my cluster and only then apply other configuration that I don't have control over. Maybe those other configurations are coming from uh, repositories that are managed by your dev teams or by your clients and so on. You want to apply uh, the policy right at Bootstrap. So this is how you, you can do it by, uh, by building a dependency graph out of your uh, infrastructure and apps. And you can, you can define dependencies between Helm releases, between plain YAMLs and other customizations, between customized overlays and so on. Um, um, that depends on uh, graph takes into account all, all the um, flux um, sinks, so to say. Other features that we've, we've added in, in version two is the possibility to uh, impersonate a Kubernetes service accounts when you do a reconciliation. So let's say you have a Helm chart and you don't have control over what's uh, in that Helm chart. But you know for sure that that particular app shouldn't, shouldn't create, for example, when, when it gets installed, shouldn't create um, an ingress uh, definition or it shouldn't create a cluster role binding. It shouldn't make itself cluster admin and so on. How can you prevent that? You can prevent it by uh, telling Flux, hey, when you install this particular app, use this service account. And for that service account, you can set up uh, restrictions using a role binding, for example, and you can say from this repository or from this Helm chart, all the things that are applied on the cluster cannot modify anything else but objects inside that particular namespace, right? So we have namespace encapsulation, but it's not only about uh, namespaces. Uh, one app can you know, reflect itself inside the cluster in multiple namespaces, right? Maybe uh, an app is composed of microservices and you have a database namespace and a front-end namespace and so on. Um, what you can do is create a cluster role binding for that particular service account and grant that service account access only to those namespaces. So it's, it's not only about one app, one namespace, it's about what that app 
needs to do inside the cluster, you'll allow it to do it, but only that thing, uh, nothing more. So this is, how I call it, soft multi-tenancy that Kubernetes offers through namespaces and, and RBAC, but that doesn't mean that, you know, is the right way for everybody. Uh, in, in many cases, you may want hard multi-tenancy where for each tenant, you dedicate a cluster or a set of clusters. Um, and for that, Flux integrates uh, with um, Kubernetes uh, cluster API. And what you can do is in your um, um, fleet repo, you can place their cluster definitions and you install Flux on your management uh, cluster. There on the management cluster, is, it's running Flux and it's also running your uh, cluster API provider, right? When you add, for example, a new cluster definition, then you can tell Flux to apply that cluster definition, wait for the cluster to be created and then you can tell Flux, hey, on that particular cluster, please reconcile that particular repository, which is your tenant repository. And this way you can isolate tenants at cluster level and have a, a hard multi-tenancy approach to you know, dealing with, with tenants and so on. Um, other things with, uh, we have in Flux, um, we, I've uh, integrated with Mozilla SOPS. If you uh, haven't heard of it, is um, Mozilla SOPS is a tool, is a, is a CLI that lets you uh, encrypt um, fields inside that file so you can uh, safely place a uh, Kubernetes secret manifest in a public Git repo and no one will be able to see what's in there. Um, the, the manifest will be encrypted and only Flux or the cluster where Flux runs only there is the private key. And you don't need to run a, yet another controller. Flux does that by default. You just tell Flux, hey, use this PGP key to decrypt the secrets in my Git repo or connect to this cloud KMS implementation, be it AWS, Azure Vault, uh, Google KMS, and so on. Uh, SOPS integrates with so many uh, backends, uh, even HashiCorp Vault, I think. And Flux will uses Mozilla SOPS as a library and can connect all these um, uh, providers, pull the, the private key from there, decrypt the secret before it applies it on the cluster, right? So in this way, you have secret management out of the box with uh, SOPS on the client side and um, Flux uh, on the server side in, in your clusters. Um, we also use, you, you can also use GPG to authenticate um, not to authenticate, to, um, you know, verify that the person that made the particular change in, in the, in the uh, Git repo is allowed to do that. Um, and, and the way to, uh, um, to enforce this kind of authentic, uh, uh, this kind of validation is by making your uh, teams use uh, GPG to sign commits. Then, you collect the, the public keys from all the team members that are approved to make a, a change, let's say on your production cluster. And you tell Flux, hey, only these people are allowed to make changes. So let's say someone hacks your, your GitHub account, uh, it will have access to the repository, everything in there, it can change something and that something will be deployed on production. But if that person doesn't also steal your private key, your, I don't know, UB key and so on, then even if it commits in your name because it has the, your GitHub authentication, that change will not be applied on the cluster because Flux will verify the signature. Uh, it will not match or it will have no signature and it will reject any change to the cluster from that moment on. And what Flux will do will send an alert, a uh, Kubernetes event, and you can configure um, uh, alerting through Slack to other um, um, uh, messaging platforms and let you know, hey, someone has used, uh, has commit something, but is not in the uh, approved list. So uh, you can uh, you know, act on it and uh, figure out what's going on. But the important part is that unauthorized changes will never be applied on the cluster if you use commit signing. 
Going next, uh, Lee already mentioned um, flux observability features. Uh, we expose now uh, things uh, as a custom resource in the custom resource a substatus resource. So what, what that means is that you can do QCAT get, QCAT describe and see if something goes wrong, when, uh, when did the flux last apply the commit, what git is, uh, is applied on the cluster and so on. Um, we, we also allow you to create health checks for workloads and also custom resources. For example, you could create a check for a, I don't know, um, open fast uh, function or something like that. That's not native Kubernetes, but if it has a ready condition or, or something that's uh, compatible with case status, we'll be able to look at it and you know, uh, give you the, uh, the end result. And Flux, when you, when you define a health check, what Flux does is it waits for that health check to resolve. So if you push 10 commits and Flux will apply the first one, it will not apply any other changes to the system unless the health check has a resolution, it either works or it fails, right? So this way you can ensure um, yet again, a transactional mode of how things are applied on the cluster. Uh, we also issue Kubernetes events for everything that's happening. So if you have a, um, if you have a tool that, you know, gets the Kubernetes events and stores them in your Elasticsearch and so on, you can build your own notification system only based on those events. We also, also the Flux controllers are using uh, structured logging in JSON format. So if you use a cloud for storing logs, you will, uh, you can automatically create, automatically, you can easily create alerts based on type error or a filter by custom resources and so on. Um, we also ship Grafana dashboards. You have an example here where everything that's defined in, um, in Flux uh, exposes Prometheus metrics. So you can use, let's say, Prometheus alert manager to build your alert. And you have so many options now on how you want to you know, look into what Flux is doing. And uh, I, I also want to mention uh, the commit status update feature. This was uh, implemented by Philip, um, one of the Flux maintainers. So like CI, if you, if you go to, I don't know, GitHub, GitLab, uh, and so on, you'll see that when a CI job runs, uh, the result of that uh, job is posted back on your uh, commit uh, in Git, and you can see if that uh, commit has been successfully built or it failed. Now, in the same way, Flux can reflect what's happening with your, uh, with your changes inside the cluster. If you configure Flux to uh, write back to GitHub commit status, you, you should create a, a token that allows Flux only to do that. Um, for example, if a health check fails, Flux will write back to your uh, to your Git on that commit, and it will tell you uh, what um, let's say what deployment is failing, or if the validation fails, and so on. So, if you want instant feedback in your um, you know, Git platform without going to Slack or Discord or other platforms, you can have that um, status posted right there. And it works with also with Azure DevOps, Bitbucket, and we are working on, on expanding this uh, commit status feature uh, to other platforms. Oh. Okay. Let's talk about platform engineers. So, if you're a platform engineer and you want to build something that, you know, Flux doesn't do, um, you, can, you can use our toolkit. So in order to develop uh, Flux version two, we first build, um, um, it's like an SDK, if you think about it, uh, and we call it the GitOps toolkit. And a GitOps toolkit is composed out of APIs, which are represented as uh, Kubernetes custom resource definitions. Uh, controllers and Golang packages. So all these things together, if you put them together, you can uh, build um, uh, CD pipelines. But maybe you don't want to build continuous delivery things. Maybe you want to build continuous integration things. Uh, and maybe you want to use um, some components from, from Flux to achieve that. 
but Flux will not build your source code or not do anything with it. But you can use the toolkit and build your own controllers and extend it in that way if that's uh, what you are uh, looking for. At the core of the GitOps toolkit is a controller and an API called a source controller. What source controller does is uh, it can uh, pull um, artifacts from external uh, sources like uh, Git repos, like S3 buckets, Minio, any kind of S3 compatible uh, storage will work. Also, uh, Helm repositories and so on. And you can build your own consumer that reacts to uh, source changes. Let's say you do a git commit, source controller will pull that commit inside the cluster, then will let your consumer know, hey, there is a new version, you want to do something with it? And your consumer can take that new version and act on it. So based on this workflow, this is how we've built Flux version two and we've We've developed specialized reconcilers that are using the, uh, the source APIs and the artifacts the source controller creates. And um, these specialized reconcilers are customized controller, uh, something that knows how to apply customized overlay or even plain YAMLs from a repo or from an S3 bucket. Um, we have a Helm controller that is specialized for Helm operations. It knows how to install a, a Helm chart, how to upgrade it, how to run tests for it. It knows how to roll back that particular version if the test failed and so on. And we also have uh, controllers that are built for uh, automation like the image reflector control and the image automation control. I'll, I'll talk about that um, in a bit. If you want to get started with the, with the GitOps toolkit and write your own controller, we have a, a, a guide published on our uh, docs uh, where you can create a, a source watcher. So it's a controller uh, built with kube builder and, uh, and controller runtime uh, that collaborates with source controller, detects that something has changed and pulls the artifact from source controller. And from there, you can take decisions on your own, what you want to do with those changes. Yeah, so please check out uh, Source Watcher if you if you are into you know building your own uh, pipelines. Okay, we finally got to app uh, developers as as our uh, use case. So as an app developer, if you want to do if you want to deliver your app on some cluster, you'll have to uh, take several steps. Of course, you make a change to your source code. You'll have to build that change into a container image. You'll be pushing that container image to a, a registry. Then um, you'll have to update your deployment manifest with the image tag that you've just pushed. Then you'll do a kubectl apply of your uh, deployment manifest on a particular cluster or on several clusters. Right. So um, this is the journey of, from source code to uh, to a cluster. Um, manually with you know, uh, CLI tools. Now, if we add automation to this uh, workflow, CI can, uh, can help you get to an immutable artifact, a container image that you push to your registry and you never change. And you can do that by using your Git SHA and the timestamp or um, the server or something that you is unique. You have to tag uh, your image with something that is unique. And the important part is you'll never override that image tag. That's the only way to have a consistent versioning of your, of your system. Now, the continuous delivery part will deal with something changed the deployment manifest. Okay, I have to deploy on one cluster or many clusters, uh, depending on the environments. Now, who does the update in the deployment manifest itself? Um, you can have your CI system right to the, I don't know, the Git repo where the manifests are. Maybe the Git repo is the same as the source code. But that means CI yeah, have to, you know, deal with YAML, we have to do replace on that and so on. 
Um, Flux comes with its own uh, automation solution for that. So instead of uh, having to deal with replacing image tags and so on from CI, you will push the image to your container registry. And from there, Flux will uh, decide based on a policy that you have defined if it should uh, be updated or not and how that works. Let's see. So we have two controllers uh, that are collaborating on, on this feature. One controller is called image reflector controller. And what this controller does, it scans uh, container registries based on a policy that you have defined and based on a, a image repository uh, um, configuration where you, for example, specify how uh, the reflector should authenticate to connect to that uh, repository. And inside the policy, you specify which tags uh, should be taken into account and how Flux should order them. For example, you could use uh, sample ranges and uh, determine the latest version based on a sample expression. Or you can use regex and um, ordering by uh, timestamps or using a numbering order. Let's say you, you have an incremental build ID and you can add that to your tags and you can tell Flux to order them by, by the build ID to determine what's the latest uh, version that you want to define. And finally, you configure Flux to write back that change to the Git repo. And that's the image automation controller. What the image automation controller does is when um, the reflector detects a new tag, it takes that tag, it uses um, customized libraries called KAML, a customized library called KAML. It clones your repo. It finds where it needs to replace that particular tag. It replaces that, that tag in your YAML file. Then it commits the YAML file back to the repo, right? When that happens, source controller will detect, oh, there is a new change in the um, cluster config repo or in your fleet management repo. And it will do what it's supposed to do. It will pull the change, then Helm or customize control or whatever uh, reconciler you have will apply that new image on your cluster. So how Flux does um, image automation is not by changing the cluster state directly, is by always reflecting changes from other systems inside your Git repo. And what that means is that you can see a commit made by Flux. You can, you know, during an incident, you can pause the image update automation. You can roll back that commit. You can go there and disable maybe the automation for, I don't know, the weekend and so on. Maybe you don't want, you don't want to deploy on Fridays, right? So you can, you can disable only that uh, object, which is the image update automation. That doesn't mean your cluster state is not correcting drifts and so on. What you are doing, you are just pausing uh, uh, a certain automation in your continuous delivery system. And we've, we've added uh, features for you to feel comfortable during an incident, to not fight Flux. So in, in, in version one, you had to scale Flux to zero because if you want to edit something, then Flux will override it and so on. Um, in version two, we allow you to suspend for a, a, um, for a time interval, a particular reconciliation. So let's say you have, a, you have an incident for a particular app and that app comes from a Helm release. Instead of disabling everything, you can just say, I want to suspend the reconciliation of that Helm release from this moment on doesn't matter what changes, I don't want the Helm release to be upgraded. I want to go there, use, I don't know, Helm CLI and uh, do my own thing to fix the issue. Then after you determine what needs to be fixed, those changes should end up in Git as a fix, right? After you committed the, the, the fix in Git, then you can resume uh, Flux operations and Flux will pull the latest version, maybe it's the same stuff with what you already did on the cluster and nothing will change. But the idea is that now you have fine grain control of what's happening and when it's happening inside your cluster. It's not a do it all thing, like uh, I'm reconciling everything or nothing. 
So that's those are some uh, good steps we made in, in, in that direction. Um, you want to mention something Lee, here about um, uh, updates automation. Yeah, this is um, this is a cool thing to point I out. I, I oh, can you okay. you can't hear me now. I can. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this is a cool thing to point out. Um, is that image update automations because we've built Flux in such a composable way, and there are these other powerful continuous delivery features. Uh, it works really well alongside two things. Uh, one is the tagging policies that you can use with Git repos and Helm releases is you can rely on Flux to, like you said, reflect those changes from an image registry. You can get those changes into your repository, but that doesn't necessarily need to release at that point to every environment that you have, right? And so because you can still keep manual control uh, or use other systems to decide when a stage tag gets applied to that commit that Flux made to your repo, right? Or when the production tag gets promoted to that point in the repo. And uh, I think that that's really cool. The other point is that the way that we've done image updates uh, composes super well with more mature manifest workflows. So uh, I'm really excited about uh, how that comment annotation on any structured file in the repo um can function with manifest generation style use cases like from flux one uh, where you can now get those image automation updates into some config that then produces your manifests uh, without being worried about it having to be coupled to the specific type of deployment resource you have uh, so it's just like a way more flexible way of designing it um right, and right. composes super well yeah Right, good point. We we in, in the past, Flux version one was only capable of patching uh, image tags inside uh, the native Kubernetes uh, workload definitions. That means a deployment, stateful set, daemon set, and cron job. But now in in version two, and because we use uh, uh, the uh, the KML library, we are able to patch any kind of Kubernetes custom resource. We don't have to know about it. If, if it's a custom resource, if it subscribes to Kubernetes API, we, uh, based on, on the marker that you've had there, we are able to patch it. So for example, we can now patch um, 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 customization configuration. We can patch a hand release file. We can patch, I don't know, a tecton task that, I don't know, builds, uh, builds your images. Maybe you want to, let's say you have a tecton uh, task that uh, builds with Go, right? So, and you want to always build using the latest Go patch version where CVs are shipped, right? So you want mm -hmm. to keep your AI system up to date. You can just use these two controllers and you can, uh, you can update all your, um, all your CI pipelines. Uh, so they will be using the, the, the latest uh, yeah. version. It doesn't even need to be an object that lives in Kubernetes that you update the image tag with. It can be any YAML file that has some Kubernetes structure, like the customization YAML that you mentioned. Uh, and that opens the door for like communicating your image updates to not just Kubernetes, right? But systems that produce Kubernetes manifests or other things that would want to know about your image updates, like uh, CI system that does security vulnerability scanning. You know, lots of cool things you could do. So. Yeah, and one one last thing about image automation, what we are currently working on is being able to push the change to a different branch. And how this works, you say, hey, I want to use the image automation, but I don't want it to commit back to the same branch. So it doesn't get deployed automatically. I want to commit it to a new branch then maybe I'm using a GitHub action or a GitLab CI uh, helper that will open a pull request with all the changes that Flux has determined that you need on your cluster. So someone from your SRE team can review it, merge it, and only then those updates will be applied on the cluster. And 
um, that's uh, that that will be released in the in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, I'm running out of time. I'm going to uh, escape real fast here. So this is how Flux version two looks like. Uh, built on top of the toolkit, it's in a way it's a continuous loop here. You push changes um, manually. CI pushes artifacts. Uh, Flux pushes patches and so on, and everything ends up as an event uh, back to you as a notification and so on. And of course, Flux now can um, you know control more than one cluster and um, reconcile it from more than one source. If you have questions, if you have proposals, if you want to talk to us, uh, we are uh, happy users of uh, GitHub discussions. That's where all the API changes, all the proposals are going. So um, of course you can reach us on the CNCF Slack, but for you know uh, future requests and so on, please use the discussion is a, is a great environment to debate on, on new things. And that was it. Thank you very much. Bye, friends. Bye-bye. Check us out on Flux.